Today, I want to give you an introduction to the book of Revelation, and I hope you understand that I'm just the messenger boy, okay? I hear God, and I do exactly what God says. And uh, about two weeks ago, he shared with me the message that I'm going to share with you today. And he said, the reason I want you to do this is because where your people are is exactly where the disciples were when they spoke to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. See, they were just as human as you and I are. And we are a curious being. We want to know what's out there. We want to know what's going to happen in the future. And the promise that Jesus gave his disciples to that day is the same promise that fits our uh, time period that we are living in right now. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, and we're going to look at the first 14 verses there. Then next week, I will start actually verse by verse uh, up through the book of Revelation. And by the way, I wrote these three sermons uh, while I was at home and sick these last two weeks. Uh, so, you know, I, I do get to do some things while I'm at home other than watching TV. I get tired of television. I don't know about you, uh, but I'd rather be right here with God's people. Let me give you the outline, signs of the times. Number one, a time of deception. There will be and there is. That's what I want you to understand, that what Jesus is speaking about is talking about the first half of the tribulation period. And let me just, while I'm at it, just give you a short synopsis. I believe the next thing on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. And I have, I, I just need to preface this, there are people that do not believe in the rapture. Just in the last two weeks, I was given a piece of paper that was basically saying there is going to be no rapture. And, and again, everyone can have their own opinion about what's going on. But when I look at Scripture and I see what is going on, I'm just telling you, I believe that is the next thing uh, on uh, God's uh, prophetic agenda. And when the rapture takes place, It'll start the first half of the tribulation. The tribulation period is seven years. The first, and, and you have to understand, when, when the rapture occurs, what's going to happen? Folks, wherever Christians are, they're not going to be. If you got a Christian pilot and you're on a plane, you better hope you go that way and not this way, all right? Can you imagine a Christian doctor sitting in a, a surgery, doing a surgery, and he's gone? Okay, and you're going to read, we are going to read the verse. The last scripture I give will show you exactly what God says about this. So it'll be a time of chaos. And then there will be a leading, a world leader that comes on and, and again, embraces Israel. He is what I call the little Savior. There's only one Savior, capital S, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. But he will look like a Savior, and he'll come in, and he'll settle things down. But halfway through that three and a half years, I'm telling you, uh, and, and again, I'm not giving you a derogatory uh, word, but all hell is going to break loose in that second half of the tribulation period. You, there are things that are going to happen that you couldn't write it on a script. You just have to study it. You have to believe it. And then after that, Jesus will come back at the Battle of Armageddon, and folks, I'm telling you, he will destroy the enemies of God. And then we will have the millennial period of a thousand years where it'll be perfect peace, and you know, he'll, he'll uh, you know, chain up Satan and all the demons. And then after that, I'm telling you, it's the great white throne judgment, and then we will after that go to our final dwelling place. All right, so that is a short synopsis, and, and there's lots of things to fill in in all of that that I don't have time for, but that'll just give you my interpretation. And, and again, folks, uh, you, know, you know, my interpretation, I, I'm not saying it's always right, but I'm telling you, I believe, I study, I take my time, and, and I don't really want to debate people, okay? All right, I, I really don't. You have your own way of looking at things, and we may differ in some areas, 
But just realize, folks, my job is to preach the Word of God and say, thus saith the Lord, according to what the Lord tells me to do. So I'm uh, just obeying the Word of God. So in this, signs of the times, a time of deception. Number two, a time of destruction. Okay? Destruction. It, it's incredible, the destruction that'll happen. And a time of deliverance. Oh, folks, I cannot wait. We talk about rapture and we talk about seeing Jesus. We talk about, you know, leaving this earth and going to a perfect place. Folks, there is no perfect place on the earth. We're just pilgrims. We're just passing through. We just put up a tent, all right? This is not our permanent dwelling place. You get the finest, you know, home that you can find in the United States, and I'm telling you, it is nothing compared to heaven. Nothing. So, signs of the times. Uh, Jesus' message in Matthew 24 is known as the Olivet Discourse because he spoke to the disciples on the Mount of Olives. And we know that was uh, right next to Jerusalem. Uh, it was on the highest peak and the highest hill there. So when they were looking out, they could see all of Jerusalem and the beauty there. And the di disciples asked two questions, and Jesus gave the longest answer found in the New Testament to these two questions. Jesus' purpose in this teaching was to give his disciples clarity and encouragement uh, to, to a misunderstood concept of how the world we know it is going to end. The disciples and the Old Testament prophets believed that Jesus' coming and establishing his kingdom was one single event, but the Bible teaches otherwise in the book of 1 Thessalonians and Revelation. Lots of people get the rapture of the church and the second coming mixed up. And folks, they are not the same event as we will show you. They had no clue about the church age that would intervene between his two comings. Let's look at this incredible scripture from the mouth of Jesus himself. Matthew 24, 1, then Jesus went out uh, uh, and departed from the temple. His disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And again, it, you know, when we think of the temple, it was huge. It was beautiful. Uh, it was incredible, uh, you know, structure. And it was the place uh, where the Holy Spirit uh, was. And it says, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And what Jesus was telling them was he knew that in A.D. 70, the Romans were going to destroy the temple. And I'm telling you, when I say destroy, uh, they, they leveled that place. And that's what got the disciples thinking. And I know, what, or at least I feel like what they were thinking was, if, you know, uh, the, the temple was going to be destroyed, that has to be tied in with Jesus' coming, okay? And they thought this event, and I'll tell you why I believe they thought this event would happen, was because of the triumphal entry, because all that responded to Jesus, and even in their lifetime, they would look and they would think, you know what, Jesus is going to take over and he's going to throw out the Roman government and we are going to be part of the ruling right now, right here. So they were thinking in their minds, this is going to happen really quick. But they did not understand what Jesus was trying to tell them. Uh, look at verse 3. Now, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And you have to understand, you know, these questions are something that, that we all think about. Okay, what are the signs? And the reason I am doing this and, and what I'm trying to get you to see today is there is an exact parallel of what is going on today with what's going to be going on in the tribulation period. And so what it tells me is, and, and I believe this is the reason God uh, asked me and, and encouraged me to, to, to preach this sermon, is that the rapture of the church could happen 
any time now. You look at what we will see today, and I am telling you, every one of these signs, okay, not, not sign, every one of these signs in our world has already taken place, and you will see that. So we need to understand that time is short. Time is short. And there's two thoughts in this, and I want to give this right off the bat, and I'll say it again at the end. Number one, and the most important thing about these signs is, are you ready to meet your Savior? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today or the rapture of the church would come today, you are going with the body of Christ? And then the second thing it begs for us as Christians is, we don't have a lot of time to do what God has commissioned us to do. He has told us to take the gospel to all the nations. And really, literally what he has done, he has brought the nations to us. They're right here in Fort Smith. They're down, Scott, in Fort Worth. They're up in Cincinnati. They're all over the place. And we need to understand it is our responsibility to get the message out to everyone we can. So, verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and I will, uh, I will deceive many. And folks, there is deception all over our world. People can look you right in the eye and lie like a dog. There are people that come on TV and you have to understand, just because a guy has a suit on, that doesn't make him a preacher. Okay? Just because a guy can get airtime and buy airtime, I am telling you, I can listen to somebody less than five minutes, and I can tell you whether you need to be listening to that person or not. And again, folks, it's the Holy Spirit. It's discernment. But there are false prophets. Do, do, now, I'm kind of dating myself. But Jim Jones, remember what happened to Jim Jones in over 800 people? He convinced them to drink the orange juice, and every one of them died that day. So I'm just telling you, folks, people can be deceived. They can. And we need to understand, and, and folks, the, the things that you have to understand— about listening to someone, number one, look at their life. Does their life match up to Christianity? The second thing, what is their motive? What is their motive? And I understand it costs money, all right, to be on TV and things, but folks, some are, are, are really taking advantage of that. I looked last night, and for $333, they'll mail you seeds of blessings, <laughs> all right? What I wanted to say, you give me a hundred and I'll just pray for you, <laughs> okay? I mean, if you're going to do that, and I am joking, okay? I am joking, all right? Things just pop into my head, okay? I would never do that. I would never do that. And I'm, I'm not making light of it. I'm simply saying, folks, please, it is God that gives the blessings. It is God. And a lot of people are motivated by money. So you have to discern. There are false prophets. There are false teachings. There are people that said, I am coming in the name of the Lord. And the third thing you have to understand is what this guy's saying lining up with the Word of God. And if it's not lining up with the Word of God, folks, he's a false prophet. Okay? So we need to understand. Matthew chapter 24 Go to verse 23. Go to verse 23. And again, we're talking about in this particular place, the second half of the tribulation. Then if anyone says unto you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, even, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you, beforehand. I am telling you that Satan, you know, Satan is behind everything, folks, that is evil. The Antichrist will sweep in, and he'll be a smooth talker, all right? 
He'll be very be believable. He'll be elegant. You know, he, his words, he'll be able to preach, uh, you know, and, and talk to people and convince people. All right? And, and again, he is going to, he's going to have a lot of clout, uh, you, know, uh, you know, not just political clout, but, but monies that is backing him too. And, and then we have the false prophet also. And that is the demonic trinity that they are speaking about in there. And so we have to understand, be careful today, okay? Be careful who you listen to and what you believe. And the same thing is true about writing a book. Anybody can write a book, folks. If you have the money, you can get it published. But make sure it's from God and it lines up with the Word of God. 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destruction, hearsays, even denying the Lord who uh, bought them and bringing on themselves swift destruction. Now look at verse 2. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom uh, whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. You know what is going on today, folks? Society is making right wrong and wrong right. As Cody preached last week and did a great job from everything I heard, folks, abortion is wrong. This transgender stuff, it's wrong. It is sin. Folks, living together is wrong. Being a drunkard, an alcoholic is wrong. We could just go down through the list of things. And what Satan wants to do is deceive us in this and make right wrong and wrong right. Folks, I'm just telling you, even in our world, we can see it in everyday life. Again, I watched more television than I wanted to. But the homosexual agenda is unbelievable on the television. It's just there all the time. And we are called narrow-minded. No, we're not narrow-minded, folks. We're Christ-minded. We're going to do what God says to do. So these false teachers are coming in, and they're lying. And they're telling right is wrong and wrong is right. And we should know better. Verse 3, by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. They're going to be here, folks. They're going to be here. They are already here. We have to battle against sin. We have to let people know this isn't right. What you are trying to manipulate isn't right. We must stand on the Word of God. So there'll be a time of deception. And number two, a time of destruction. A time of destruction. Look at verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. One year anniversary, Russia invaded. I mean, again, folks, Russia is a huge player in all this. Huge player. And, and rumors of wars. Uh, North Korea, I, I mean, folks, we better keep our eye on North Korea. China, all of these are in time nations. All of these, I believe, will be part of that 10 European nations that will go and stand against Israel. And folks, we better stand with Israel. Amen. It's God's chosen people. You want to get whooped, you just... You just deny Israel, folks, all right? And, and, and we have to understand all this is prophetic. He is saying these things are coming. And folks, what I'm trying to tell you today, they've already come true in our life. How can, how can you not see this? See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And again, a lot of people th think, you know, and I've even heard as I was growing up, you know, World War III, it's going to end the world just the way, you know, it's going to be World War III, somebody's going to blow the whole planet up. No, folks, Jesus said, hey, that's not the end. War is always going to be with us. There's going to be, a, 
And, and again, folks, uh, you know, we live in a free country. I know there's a lot of things not right with our country as a whole, but we have the freedom to worship Christ and to come, and they're going to try to take some of those freedoms away from us. But we are going to stand strong on the Word of God. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And we see that. There will be famines. Folks, famines everywhere. I mean, you could just look and you hear of people starving in third world countries. Pestilence and earthquakes in various places. Over 55,000. The, the earthquake in Turkey and Syria have lost their lives. Even when it comes to pestilence, it, it can, uh, you know, talk about disease too. We just basically come out of the COVID era, okay? And again, I, 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 in no way am I making any of, any of this political, folks, but there were literally millions of folks that died of COVID, okay? And I'm simply saying these are signs of the times in which we live in. All these are the beginning of sorrows. What does it tell me? It's not, it's not even close to over yet, folks. And even Jesus himself talked about, you know, comparing the end times with birth pains and labor. And again, I thank God for our ladies that go through that for us. All right? But we know how birth pains work, okay? The closer you get to birth, the more intense the pain is. And folks, that's what's happening in our world today. Did you realize, and I, it blew me away, already there's been 74 mass shootings in the United States of America, and we have not even hit March 1st yet. Okay? That's crazy, folks. That's crazy. Verse 9, and then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you, and will, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And folks, I've been in third world countries. I've talked to pleasant people and I've talked to unpleasant people. And the unpleasant people don't want you in their country. And they will even tell you that, hey, y'all are rich folks, okay? Y'all are spoiled. We don't want you in our country. And again, I'm not talking about missionaries. I'm not talking about, I'm just simply saying there are people that, that believe that and even voice that. And many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Folks, there is so much hate going on in our world today. Just pure hate. And folks, I'm telling you, there's that progression, uh, even Ephesians uh, chapter uh, uh, 4 tells us, you know, hey, you know, it just starts with anger. And anger leads to hate. And hate leads to really just to destruction, folks. Destruction. And people will cuss you out, okay? People will cut you off. Saw one deal uh, where some guy, some guy got cut off. He, he chased this other guy down, got out of his car, got his gun, and shot the guy right on the street there. Folks, that's hate, okay? That's malice. And these things are going on as we speak. Then they will deliver you up and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Folks, there's, there's missionaries that die on the mission field. They literally die for the cause of Christ. They are the ones trying to smuggle Bibles in so people can get saved. They're the ones that put their life on the line, uh, you know, maybe leading an underground church, hiding from government authorities because if they're caught, they will either be put in prison or they'll be executed. And it says, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And here's the kicker, folks. Look at verse 12. And because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Folks, this is going on in our world right now. Lawlessness. There is not a respect 
for the police and people of authority. And I understand uh, these five policemen, yes, they need to be brought before and they need uh, to answer for what they did. But it doesn't mean all of the policemen are like that, folks. We need to respect the policemen. We need to teach our kids to respect the law and to respect those who are protecting us. And the love of many will grow cold. And again, in, in these mass shootings, you know, uh, I heard one of the quotes on one of them that simply just said, you know, I just wanted to see how, how you know, what it was like to kill somebody. And they call that the thrill kill. And folks, that is going on in America right now. In America. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Paul, speaking to Timothy, says, but know this, that in the last days, folks, we're living in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, swearing, taking the Lord's name in vain, uh, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, that goes on every day in our country, slanders, without self-control, self brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers for God. Folks, pleasure is what, I mean, it's like we live, Americans live for pleasure. And it, there's nothing wrong with going on a nice vacation. But folks, God needs to be first in our life and in everything we do. And here's the dangerous part, having a form of godliness, but denying its power and, fu and from such people turn away. So we see in the signs of the times, in which we are living in. And Jesus was trying to tell the disciples. And you know, the other thing, I had never thought of this, you know, and there's probably a lot of things I've never thought of. But while I was sitting at home, I was just thinking, you realize that the disciples, John was one, the John who wrote this book, and he was hearing these things, not even knowing he was going to write the book of Revelation. Now, folks, if that's not God, I don't know what is. I don't know what else, honestly, we can do to prove that God is a real, God is in control, God is alive, and God's going to end this thing one day. It's all here in Scripture, and the love of many will grow cold. And the last thing, and I'm going to leave on a positive thing. I know it's been a lot of negative stuff, but folks, it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Verse, verse 13, a time of deliverance, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Amen. One of the things I believe and one of the things I preach in the Scripture that backs it up is the security of the believer, folks. Once saved, and here's what I like to put in, truly saved, always saved. Amen. Folks, we win. I don't care what we have to go through. I don't care how bad it gets. We win. It looks like Satan is winning right now. And, and again, uh, you know, when we think about it, uh, you know, all these things God allows to happen because, and folks, it really goes back to the fall of mankind. When sin came on earth. When Adam and Eve sinned, I'm telling you, sin plagued all of mankind. But God has always given us a choice. We don't have to sin. We don't. If we are Christians, my Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So we win. It says, who endures to the end shall be saved. In verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. You know what the world is doing right now? It's watching Christianity. It's watching us. What is our reaction to all that is going on? What is our witness to all that's going on? 
What is our testimony to all that's going on? And folks, you should not worry as a Christian about when the world's going to end. Because only God knows when that's going to happen. You must understand your job is simply to live. And that's what Jesus was basically telling the disciples in this. He was going to die soon. He was going to the cross soon. And he gives them this Matthew 24 to wake them up and say, I'm not going to be here anymore. These things are going to happen. And folks, I'm telling you, uh, you know, the disciples, some of them, you know, several of them were martyrs, okay? They died for the cause of Christ. So why are we any less than that, folks? It would not surprise me at all if there's that persecution that would just get more intense and more intense and more intense. And he was trying to tell them, hey, this, this stuff's going to get real, all right? He was commissioning them. He was encouraging them. Man, don't lose hope. Don't run and hide. Don't worry about this stuff. Man, I, my, my spirit is going to be here. We are going to help you through these times. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 36. And I close with this. But of that day and of that hour, no one knows Folks, that's Jesus' words. If somebody gives you a date, <laughs> just slowly walk away from that person. All right? They do not know what they're talking about. It's like the Y2K. Remember that? And people were putting food lockers in their homes. One guy was up on his roof waiting because he thought he'd get to heaven a little quicker than everybody else. Folks, no one knows the day, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. As in the days of Noah, is this not us? Were so we will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the day before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And God didn't and God did not know until the flood came, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. If you'll read that carefully, the last part of that, before the rain came. It said, God shut the door. Folks, we are living in the church age. We are right now living in the age of grace. You can walk down the aisle today and give your heart and life to Christ, and nobody is going to stop you. Matter of fact, we're going to clap for you. We're going to rejoice for you. And folks, this is not a scare tactic in any way at all. It is my responsibility as your pastor to make sure everyone knows that if the rapture would come, they are going to be with the Lord. And it says, and it says in verse 40, uh, take them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the meal, one will be taken and the other one left. Watch therefore, watch Notice that word. You do not know what hour the Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of that house had known the hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So what is Jesus saying? Be ready. Don't get caught in the dark. Don't believe lies that society is telling you. Know that you know that you know. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit may convict somebody that they need to be saved today. My prayer is that you will not wait for anything else. But if, that's, if you are not sure, my prayer is as soon as the music starts, you will come and, give, and you will give your heart and your life to Jesus know one of the neat things revival has broken out the ashbury university anybody following all that's going on there that is revival and folks those are college students in kentucky 
And there have been breakouts also at the University of Georgia and Minnesota and Wisconsin and Iowa and North Dakota. What does that tell me? God's not through yet, folks. Isn't it kind of neat that God may bring a worldwide revival through college students? And we need to pray, pray for this revival. And ask ourselves, could it begin with me? Wouldn't you love revival to break out this morning? Wouldn't you love to see a long invitation to where people are getting their hearts and their lives right with Jesus Christ? Folks, I've been at it. I was in a service with Dr. J. Harold Smith, two and a half hours and 70 people were saved. I saw it with my own eyes. So God's not finished. Let's be ready. Father, thank you for the day. And thank you for your word. God, your word is so true. It is yes, it is for sure, it is amen. And God, I pray for this revival in these college campuses. God, I pray it would spread like wildfire. God, I pray many, many more would be saved. And God, I pray for our time of invitation. God, if there's just one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. And God, I pray for Christians. God, I pray that Christians would look at their own life and look at their own hearts. Are they testifying? Are they witnesses? Are they showing Christ in their everyday life? God, I pray that some would rededicate their life to Christ. Some would come forward and follow the Lord in baptism. Some would come and join our church. So God, this is your time. This is your invitation. God, I pray you do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet and would you come if God has spoken to you?